That is a hot mic. Hello, my name is Cassidy, and I'm a reference librarian here at Fable Public Library. Thank you all for being here, those in person and those tuning in virtually. Today, we welcome three wonderful speakers to discuss ADA compliance. James Mather II, Jim, has a doctorate in rehabilitation, education, and research as the executive director of Sources for Community Independent Living Services, which is a nonprofit organization in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Sources' mission is to promote the independence of persons with disabilities by facilitating and supporting their full integration and participation in all aspects of community life. Second, we have Matthew Shane Bronson, which has a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling and is the Washington County Vocational Rehabilitation Counselor for Services for the Blind. Shane previously worked at Arkansas Support Network as a Ticket to Work Specialist, which is a federal program to assist people with disabilities overcome employment barriers. Heather Grigsby has a master's degree in adult education and is currently training in the Rehabilitation Counseling Graduate Program at Euler. Heather is the Benton County Vocational Rehabilitation Counselor for Services for the Blind, and her previous experience includes working in corporate human resources. With that, let's get started. Look like we actually sat in the right order. Yeah, we did. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm Heather, and I will just kind of brief give a history of the ADA. Um, and most of the information I got is from the U.S. Small Business Administration little booklet that you can find online for free. You can download it. It is in PDF form. Um, so it comes in real big handy. It has a lot of good information in it uh, for the small businesses. Um, so if you own, operate, lease, or lease to a business, that serves the public, then you have an obligation to be ADA compliant. Uh, this includes businesses uh, and nonprofits. It was uh, signed into law on 7-26-1990 by George Bush. It is one of the most comprehensive pieces of civil rights legislation that prohibits the discrimination and guarantees that people with disabilities have the same opportunities as everyone else to participate in the mainstream life. Uh, to be protected, one must have a disability, which is defined uh, by the ADA as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. A person who has a history or record of such impairment or a person who is perceived by others as having such an impairment. Um, some of the just little short tips that business could do, uh, review the policies and procedures of your company or your business, your nonprofit, um, such as, you know, you have a policy that says that no animals are allowed. Well, you should probably review that to include like seeing eye dogs uh, in that so you could become ADA compliant. And uh, finally, there are tax credits available for small businesses. Um, and that information is right here in the little book. And the last page of it has a whole list of resources that are available. Shane or Jim? Jim, oh, start your part. All right, so I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the ADAG, which is the Americans with Disabilities uh, Accessibility Guidelines, which talks about physical access to spaces. So, uh, I have a quick little PowerPoint um, to go through. So, again, uh, kind of an overview. Uh, I uh, did a great job uh, in the bio of what sources is, but we'll go through it a little bit more. Why is access important? Uh, what is ADAG? And then resources available to folks. So, again, uh, the mission of sources is to promote the independence of persons with disabilities by facilitating and supporting their full integration and participation in all aspects of community life. So, what is sources? Sources is a center for independent living. So there's 420 approximately centers across the nation. So every state has at least one. So in Arkansas, there's four. Uh, and Sources is one of those. But um, for 
uh, and we're a federally funded entity uh, and to be controlled, which means that 51% of our staff and board are made up of people with disabilities. We're community-based, we're across disabilities, so we serve anyone with a disability. Um, we're a non-residential, private nonprofit entity, so we're not a residential facility. Um, there's been a whole, in recent times, uh, nursing homes have kind of grasped the idea of uh, independent living, uh, and so a lot of times we'll get phone calls saying, uh, can, can, do you have room for my brother, sister, parents, whatever? We have to tell them that we are not uh, a nursing home per se. Uh, we're, we're somewhat different than that. Uh, and again, that we're designed and operated within the local community uh, by individuals with disabilities. Again, back to that 51% of board and staff are people with themselves with disabilities. So we live it. Ooh. Oh, okay. I didn't know I did that, but okay. <clears throat> so, uh, why we do what we do? So, in Arkansas, so I have a few slides here that say, so, uh, again, uh, with regard to poverty, Arkansas ranks fourth in poverty with 16.2% of our population that live in poverty. Uh, we are number one in poverty increase. We are number three in uh, disability and we're number 19 in residents that are 60 plus. Again, kind of just to, <clears throat> to highlight some of the things. So, um, so again, uh, as Heather pointed out, yes. Heather pointed out, um, so again, limitations. So ADA uh, talks about um, limitations that someone has. So obviously as we age, uh, we have more more limitations. You know, I used to get on ladders and jump off ladders and do all sorts of things. I don't. My knees are not that great anymore. I don't do those things. So, but here you can see, um, you know, um, that uh, between the ages of 15 and 24, functional limitations are about 6.3 percent. Severe limitations, 2 percent. When you get to 45 to 54, functional limitations, 23 percent. Severe limitations, 6 percent. 65 to 69, 45% uh, functional limitations, severe limitations, 18.5. When it gets to be 75 or older, functional limitations, 72.5%, uh, severe, 41%. Um, and so we say functional limitations, that includes mobility, your, your ability to walk, uh, your ability to feed yourself, um, uh, use the restroom by yourself, uh, those functional limitations. limitations uh, diminish, unfortunately. However, as we age, hopefully your wealth increases. So here's some numbers so you can see. So as you, between 45 and 54, your average net worth is about $833,000. Um, again, and then 65 to 74, uh, $1.2 million. So Again, as a small business owner, as someone that looking at um, should be accessible to folks, again, as we age, uh, we, we have uh, more disability and less functionality, but we have resources to spend within your store. So that's why you should be uh, accessible to folks. Um, and I always like to say, you know, the ADA was created for a person with disabilities. Um, however, when you think about people using strollers, people using other uh, things that you may need a ramp for. Uh, those things are, I mean, today, I would much rather use a ramp than fall up and down stairs. Um, it's also a safety thing. Um, so again, here, here's just another graphic of what are the percentage of, of folks uh, with disabilities. On average, uh, nationally, uh, it, it hovers between 20 and 25 percent of the population being people with disabilities, and here you kind of see the breakdown of um, uh, display types. Um, again, one of the things to know about disability uh, that a lot of people don't think about is that disability can strike at any point in your lifetime. So, you know, it's not something, you know, uh, no one's immune, regardless of socioeconomic status, 
um, you know, anybody, whether it be a car accident, whether it be falling down stairs, uh, actually, you know, someone that was cutting down a tree, I had to let them fall on them. Um, so again, uh, it can strike at any time. Um, the other thing to know about this slide that a lot of people don't think, when you think about disability, you think about visual disabilities. However, that only counts for about 4% of the population. 96% of people with disabilities have a hidden disability. Uh, epilepsy, uh, asthma, um, diabetes, other things that you don't see that people have that can be classified as a disability. Um, again, 70% uh, of people with disabilities are born with a disability, 83% acquire. So that's what I'm talking about, that a car accident, those types of things uh, just occur within life situations uh, and they require disability. Um, so one of the core services that SOURCE is responsible for providing is individual and systems advocacy. Um, so again, I think Shane's gonna talk about kind of individual advocacy with regard to employment. Um, and kind of what I'm talking about is systems advocacy. So one of the things that we do is we'll do a accessibility uh, checklist for folks, free of charge. So we'll actually go into businesses that are interested in, in knowing what, what does the ADA say and how does my business do. We'll actually go in there. I, I have accoutrements up here that I'll show in a minute, um, just about some, um, some things that we use to look at your facility to say, are you ADA uh, compliant? Um, again, within the ADA, there are five titles. Um, Title I covers employment, that Shane's gonna talk about. Title II covers state and local governments. Title III is public accommodations and commercial facilities. Title IV is communications, or telecommunications, and then four is miscellaneous. Whatever else we forgot. Um, Again, uh, the ADA is a federal law. Uh, <clears throat> so Title II and III, um, and that's kind of what our, where I'm going to talk about, um, uh, contains scoping and technical requirements for accessibility to sites, facilities, buildings, and elements uh, for individuals with disabilities. Um, the requirements are to be applied during the design, construction, additions to, and alter alterations of sites, facilities, buildings, and elements to extent required by regulations issued by federal agencies under the ADA. So again, as we look at this, you know, there, it's throughout the whole construction phase, it's if you do renovations, um, you know, I was telling Shane earlier, you know, technically, before you get your certificate of occupancy, someone should actually go through your facility However, that in most point, most times does not occur. Um, so, um, so the access board um, is where I got a lot of the information. Um, so there are manuals. Uh, I brought a manual. A lot of times, it's just uh, you can look it up. Uh, there's resources in the back um, that I'll talk about as well. But as far as locally, that's uh, why didn't it show up? Well, <clears throat> so for instance, some of the things that Sources has done in the past um, is, uh, so we did some work with Easy Marts uh, here in Northwest Arkansas, um, just looking at uh, parking with regard to Easy Marts. Um, and a lot of times, so the ADA says it's about access, providing access, equal access to people with disabilities. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, you know, there's an easy mark by our offices, um, and they have their accessible parking right in front. They thought that was great. We have our parking right in front. The ramp, however, was on the side of their building. Um, and I, so we asked them, you know, why do you have accessible parking in front and your ramp on the side? And they're like, well, because that's a requirement. I'm like, no, the requirement is you have to have access. So it makes a lot more sense to put your accessible parking next to the ramp so people don't have to roll through your parking lot because there's a step right in front of your building. So like we can do that? Yes, it's about access, not about convenience. So, you know, that's a lot, you know, there's some misconceptions about what's required and, and what the law actually says. So no, parking does not have to be right up front. 
Parking me, it's about access to the building. Do you provide access to the building? And I said, as long as you don't put a dumpster in front of that access or do something like that by the ramp, you're fine to put parking there. Um, we actually, so, uh, unfortunately, so if you go up and down Dixon Street here in Fayetteville, uh, I encourage everyone to go up and down Dixon, uh, that you'll see that uh, a lot of the businesses on Dixon have a step up front, which makes it an next to impossible to, to get in and use a chair. Um, and what happened is, several years ago, um, the Dixon Street Beautification Project, they asked businesses if they wanted to put the accessible entrance on the back side of the building or on the front, in front. And a lot of them said, we'll put it in the back. We'll have ramps out back, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do all that stuff. Uh, and that was great for a time being. <clears throat> However, then, uh, Federal passed a smoking ordinance. So what people do, they put smoking decks on the back of their buildings and cover up the ramps. So now, if you look at Dixon Street, uh, most of the times if you use a chair, you can't get into businesses. So when they came to redesign in Flock Street, uh, Sources was involved in making sure that everybody had access to the front door. Uh, we were not responsible for parking on Block Street, so that, that was not something that we did, but we made sure that people would get in the front door, and that's what it's kind of about. Um, the, uh, one of the unique things that we did is, for those of you that, that know Eureka Springs, it's kind of a destination spot, it's an older city, um, a lot of hills. Uh, we were invited to come uh, to Eureka Springs to talk about the ADA in Eureka Springs, which was somewhat unique because there's steps and it's hilly and it's very difficult. Um, uh, but we provided them, you know, one of the things, Eureka Springs was looking at the fact that uh, they're responsible for injuries. And, you know, when you're, um, when there's older folks who talk about uh, functional limitations, people using walkers or people have some mobility impairments, uh, those streets were unlevel, different things, people fall. Um, so we're looking at how can we make our businesses more accessible. And so we went up there and we provided some information for them about, um, you know, for instance, uh, on their sidewalk, they had a, a telephone pole in the middle of uh, the sidewalk. Well, you know, either move the sidewalk or, you know, get the utility company to, to move the telephone pole. Uh, again, you're, you're creating a barrier for folks that, that may use a chair, walker, uh, and or have a, a visual impairment. So. Uh, we provide them some information as well. Um, and then just recently, uh, we were asked to do some consulting uh, uh, with a uh, public building here in town that had, uh, their elevator had failed. Um, and they, uh, individuals that needed services, the services were on the second floor. Um, and due to COVID, they did not repair the elevator because they weren't open to the public, but once it became open to the public, that elevator needed to be replaced or, or be repaired. Um, and they're saying that, no, we don't qualify because of X, Y, Z. Um, they were looking at commercial buildings and not public facilities. They were a public facility, just like the library is here. Um, they would need access to all levels of their building. So that was just recently in the last few weeks that we did that. Um, so, and we get a call, a whole host of phone calls, um, and if you were to call me, uh, you know, you may be put on hold, or I may say, oh, tell me more about that. Uh, I'm online, I'm looking at this manual, going through to find exactly the answer that you're looking for. Um, and then if you ask me to come out uh, to do uh, an accessible study, there's a checklist, and this is also within your resource. So if you as an entity want to go through, there's, you can, uh, look, and you can go through it, at, you know, if you have a, a facilities uh, person or compliance person, they can pull this off the web, they can go through and just look and see. Uh, it goes through, like I said, this is the long version, which is like 50 some pages, um, and it goes through as far as are your light switches in the right spot. Um, you know, a lot of people put uh, one of the ones that's very interesting to me is that they'll put an uh, accessible bathroom on the door itself. Um, now think about it, if you're a person who is blind or have a visual impairment, if you are searching for that door and looking for and you find it and someone opens that door, your hand is in their face. 
it's supposed to be to the left of the door, um, a certain uh, height away so people can find it and know where it's at um, and, and know that this is the correct restroom to use. So, um, so there's a lot of things like that that people, and again, the, the ADA just went through, um, so 1990, uh, ADA, uh, ADA was updated in 2010. Um, basically, earlier than that, they would say that a light switch has to be uh, 40 inch, 48 inches off the ground. Well, tape measures are all a little different. So now the, the new requirements give you a range. So to, to accommodate for floor differences and tape measures and all sorts of stuff. So it's not, you know, so you, you don't get in trouble for it being 49 inches above the ground. Um, and then yes, and then uh, here are resources. Like I said, there's the ADA.gov has the standards. Access Board also has standards. Um, <clears throat> the ADEG manual that I referenced uh, is also there. And then, uh, I'm sure Shane's going to talk about this as well, but uh, Ask Jan um, is a free that actually has any sort of accommodation that you'd ever think about uh, getting. Um, you know, regardless of disability, you can actually click on disability and it will give you accommodation suggestions and links to uh, who supplies that accommodation. Uh, and they also have a hotline that you can call and talk with them as well. So those are the kind of resources that I use. Shane? Um, well, before I talk about employment, I kind of want to branch a little bit off of what you were talking about, um, because a lot of people that maybe have an established business already, they're wondering, okay, what do I need to do to my business more accessible and unfortunately a lot of people assume that primarily means wheelchair access you know do I need a ramp do I need an automatic door things like that so one of the things to consider is that uh, disability does have a, a wide range as far as uh, people getting into the front door and having access to the services and things like that so trying to expand the, your thinking on, on what accessible means and what it means for your business, I think is an important first step to uh, creating a plan, an ADA uh, uh, accessibility plan. And so one of the things that I look at whenever we talk about ADA and, and a business is basically there's like four things you need to look at uh, when creating a plan to see what kind of changes need to be made. Uh, the first one, and Jim alluded to this earlier, is getting in the front door. What is the parking situation like? How do you want to get in the front door? Do, does someone need assistance to get in the front door? Is your door very heavy? Uh, does your door, uh, does it uh, have a handle that requires a certain amount of uh, dexterity in the hand to be able to pull on it or is it a push or what things like that it, being able to access the business through the front door is the the top priority so that should be considered first in your plan the second thing is is once you're in the door you have to make sure that you have access to the services and goods available in that business it's no good going into a restaurant or cafe or store or whatever if the shelves are in such a way that it's impossible for someone to reach it because they're too high if they're in a wheelchair or if their shelves are blocking maybe an aisleway the aisleway is too narrow for for people to navigate through if they are in a wheelchair or maybe they have signage that is uh a very small print so that someone with low vision can't see it. Um, so those kind of things are also something to consider once you get inside of that environment. And then the third thing is, is that you need to look at um, kind of the other services that are provided in that environment for instance and i'm thinking specifically of checking out if you're going to check somebody out at the register or something like that you know are the is the facility set up in such a way that somebody can access the credit card machine because sometimes if someone's going to pay their credit card there might be up on a countertop and they'll have to reach well over to, to get that or maybe there's a push button screen where they have to reach down and, and hit the the green button to say do you accept this authorization 
if you're visually impaired or have no vision, you're not going to be able to see that button. So things like that also really kind of play into your, your accessibility plan. And then finally, the last thing is any kind of like water fountains or restrooms. You know, those are very, very important for your customers, of course, to make sure that those are going to be accessible, but then also making sure that there's no, uh, uh, obstacles uh, like sometimes boxes get stacked in front of uh, pathways or whatever to get to the restrooms things like that that you know if you don't have a disability if you're not in a wheelchair you can easily navigate around that but we we're trying to remove as many barriers as possible uh, for for customers to be able to access uh, those goods and services and then on top of that I think in addition to making that, that ADA plan on, on how you're going to make those four things as accessible as possible, I think another component to that is services and training staff to help people with disabilities. That Because sometimes a lot of, of barriers can be overcome with proper staff training. Uh, for instance, I went into a restaurant uh, and I'm low vision, by the way. Um, and I went to a restaurant and they did not have any uh, large print menus. However, they the waiter was able to, I, I asked about a certain dish and he was able to read me the description of that, no problem. Um, so I think that proper training of, of the people who interact with your customers and with other uh, other employees is also a vital part of that because a lot of times simple human uh, uh, providing those services providing those accommodations is a great way to remove those barriers and believe it or not COVID has actually in a lot of ways opened up the doors a lot in, in, in for some of this as far as removing these barriers. Uh, Jim was talking about the, the restaurants and things like that on Dixon Street and that kind of reminds me of how uh, one of the options to overcome that barrier is to provide uh, you know curbside and, and pick up and delivery services and things like that which years ago before the pandemic that was kind of a limited options, but now more and more places are offering that sort of thing, or they'll uh, provide uh, uh, alternatives to, to, to menus where you can put, have an electronic version of a menu that you can have read to you, or you can uh, uh, blow it up really big on your phone if that's going to be something that you need. So there's a lot of different components to, to making uh, your, your facility as accessible as possible. Um, that being said, it is also important to look at how you can make your facility accessible for employees as well. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with uh, removing, removing safety issues, barriers, things that might cause danger. Uh, also identifying uh, elements within a task that uh, an employee needs to do that can be modified or removed. Uh, so one of the things that I like to do is whenever I have an employee, uh, a client that is getting a job and if they're having any kind of issues uh, with accomplishing that job is we do a task analysis where we look at step by step, what is that uh, client having to do to perform that task and looking at that that can be simplified or modified in some way to make it safer more efficient and more accurate uh, because ultimately employers want to have the job done right and done well and done as efficiently as possible and so being able to to from an employment point of view analyze and figure out what can you do to make these tasks as simple as possible. You can remove a lot of barriers that some employees might face uh, when it comes to, to you know, working in that environment. Um, and then like he was saying, there's Ask Jan, which looks at all kinds of accommodations that you can look at doing that are simple and very in inexpensive. And let me stress that inexpensive because a lot of times employers are intimidated by the idea of, of hiring somebody with a disability because they think it's going to cost all this money 
to, to retrofit this and to change this and whatever. Uh, and in actuality, a lot of them are simple, easy tools that an employer can implement to make it a uh, effective and safe work environment. Um, and it, there's no one size fits all solution. Uh, ultimately, you know, you do need to have someone that is uh, pretty, uh, very knowledgeable about disability, about accommodations, to come to your the work site to to identify trouble areas, things that can be improved, things that can make it easier for that employer employee not only to do things like. Um, you know, do their do job tasks, but also have access to the break room. Uh, is because they have equal access rights to not only the work site, but also the break room, the vending machine, the restrooms, all those kind of things. And so, those are just an extra layer of things to consider uh, as far as ADA and 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 hiring folks uh, that have a disability. But right now, is the perfect time for folks to with a disability to to uh, get employed. The, the job market right now is in such a way that, that uh, there's help wanted signs everywhere. And I think that the prevailing opinion is that if you hire somebody with a disability to give them a chance to, to prove themselves, to prove their worth, these are folks that want independence, they want uh, to show, have integrity, and they're wanting to contribute. They're wanting to provide for themselves. If you give them a chance, there's loyalty in that and that they will stick with the job uh, and do everything they can to make it work. But it is a relationship that has to be between the employee and, um, and the, the employer and the employee. So um, that is sort of just a broad look at in, you know, working with uh, employees with disabilities. Like I said, I am visually impaired myself and we work with services for the blind. Um, and so one of the things that we do is we help uh, people to get the uh, experience and training that they need in order to find work or continue working in the job that they're currently at. Um, so sometimes that's going to be assistive technology, uh, uh, using things like screen readers um, or technology that they can tie in with their existing work at home. Uh, or, I'm sorry, their existing uh, equipment that they use either for working from home or in that office. Uh, we uh, also do provide training on how to use things like canes, mobility devices, things like that to make sure that people are safe. Uh, so there are lots of resources out there uh, to make sure that employees have the skills that they will need and the equipment that they will need to perform these job tasks. Um, so it's not 100% rely on the employer to, to you know, fork out all this money uh, if they think it's going to cost a lot of money for to do the accommodations for this one person, that there are agencies and resources out there that can uh, assist with the planning and the recommendations um, for, for what it's going to take for that employee to be successful. So that's sort of my bit as far as the ADA goes. I'm trying to think if there's any other areas I wanted to talk about. One thing that did remind me, though, is service dogs. Uh, and I think Heather mentioned a service dog earlier. Uh, so service dogs are not just eye, see, seeing eye dogs. Uh, service dogs can provide a variety of, um, of uh, services uh, that a client needs. Uh, these can be anything from uh, an epilepsy, yeah, seizures, uh, yeah. seizures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, just a wide variety of mobility, balance. If someone's having balance issues, a doc can provide uh, assistance with that. Uh, the things I wanted to say, though, is that that is different from a uh, emotional support animal. So an emotional support animal, it does not necessarily have, uh, have that training to provide those services. Uh, and with the ADA, you uh, businesses are required to allow a service animal 
to accompany that person unless it, it may cause undue harm or safety uh, to that environment. Uh, so for instance, like um, a restaurant, uh, you, if, if someone can bring their dog to a restaurant if they're a service dog, uh, but they may not be able to bring their dog into an operating room if they're gonna have, you know, some, something removed or something because a dog being in an operating room would cause safety and harm to something, whereas a dog sitting at your feet in a restaurant would not be. Um, the thing I wanted to mention though about the service animals is that if uh, you're a business owner and if someone comes in with a service animal, you cannot ask about that person's disability. Uh, really, you had to. You can only ask two things, uh, and this is according to everything that mm -hmm. I've been told. Uh, the first thing is, is this a service animal? Okay. And the second thing is, what services is that animal providing to you? Trained to provide. Trained to provide. Yes. Uh, and and that's it. And and you cannot inquire about anything else having to do with that person uh, as far as their disability goes. Now that person, the handler, the owner of that service animal is required to control the animal, is required to clean up after the animal, all that kind of stuff. But uh, ultimately, that's, there's a limit as far as how much you can do with when it comes to service animals. But service animals are an important part of that ADA accessibility and compliance issue. So. I just wanted to throw that out there because I think it's an important part. Yeah, and to your point too, like you said, it, train to and health and safety. So if you're, let's for instance, say that you're using a service animal um, to, to, drive, uh, to ride the bus. And every time you get on the bus, this dog snarls and growls and causes a nuisance to other passengers on that bus. The, the bus folks could say that, you know, your dog is not trained uh, and as a nuisance and uh, a detriment to ride in the bus uh, and ask you not to bring the, the service animal with you. So there are some stipulations with regard to, again, it has to be trained. I mean, most dogs, most service animals uh, go through rigorous training. And so when they get on a the bus, they're just gonna lay down at your feet. They're not gonna snarl and cause accidents on the bus or doing those things. Um, so, you know, I've had arguments with folks, you know, nowadays you can buy uh, a harness that says, I'm a service animal. Um, maybe, maybe not. You know, again, uh, what, what is this dog providing to you? Mm -hmm. um, you know, just because you purchase something that says that it's a service animal online doesn't make it a service animal. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I, I will call myself out, uh, so uh, a few years back, um, I hired a, a person who was blind to work in our office. Um, and uh, uh, she had lunch every day at the office and we, we had microwave and refrigerator and everything else. And, and she's like, Jim, you know, I can't use a microwave. I don't know where the numbers are at. She mm -hmm. said, can I get some bump dots? I'm like, what are bump dots? So for five bucks, I bought packages of bump dots that she could put to where she needed the, the start button, the zero button, the corners basically, so she could eat independently at her office. So that's what Shane's talking about, you know, very uh, being able to, to access the break room, at very low cost mm -hmm. uh, accommodation that was made uh, by putting these little dot, it didn't hurt anybody else using the, the microwave or anything else, just dots that uh, located where the numbers were at for the, the person that was blind. Um, so again, the, and I forget what the number is, it's like 80% of accommodations are less than $500. So as you look at the cost of accommodations, don't be scared. Uh, as Shane said too, there's organizations out there that can help pay for some of those costs. Absolutely. So in bump dots, by the way, for those that don't know, are just, they're almost like little stickers where on the back side of it, it is a uh, sticky part of it that you peel off and you can put it on there and it's got a different texture or a shape on there. So you can identify a different uh, elements. So it can be like a square or a circle, triangle, whatever, different uh, textures on there. So you can identify uh, different things. So th those are, like I said, very easy to to use, and uh, and it's not and like as Jim was saying. I mean, it's 
it's not just for people that are blind. It's going to also be for people maybe that maybe have a, a movement disorder. And so their hands are shaking and they're needing to, you know, having that bump dot would help them to press that. So, you know, put, getting yourself in that mindset as far as what, what kind of disabilities might people face? What kind of barriers might people face whenever whenever using my services, my goods, or whatever, uh, trying to remove those barriers? Because that's where disability starts. Disability starts with barriers. Uh, and I give a pl classic example, and I wish I had a, an image of it, but if you ever go to the Walmart AMP in Rogers, they have public restrooms that are amazing. And one of the things I love about them is that you go to the, to the door and a lot of times the visually impaired person trying to see the difference between men's and women's rooms or whatever, it has got a small little thing and it's up there above the door and I can't see it and whatever. You go there and it is a six foot tall symbol on the very front of the door that I could see from a, you know across the way, even with my eyesight. And so even little things like that, making the, your, your, your signage uh, appropriate and, and, and large enough to be able to see, I think is, is so important. So yeah, a lot of little strategies, nothing big. Uh, certainly if you're looking to build a new building, certainly, you know, taking all those considerations that Jim talked about is, is essential and it's going to be worth it. You're going to get more clients, you're going to get more customers, and that's the whole idea is to increase access and, and uh, ultimately make your business more successful. So anything you'd like to add, Heather? Uh, just if somebody has a disability, keep in mind that you may not be able to see it. That's a huge uh, problem that I've came across. And, you know, just be kind to people because you never know what could be laying underneath the surface of the person themselves. So. Okay. Does anybody in the audience have any questions? <laughs> do we have any questions? I do have a quick one. Yeah. So do you guys ever work um, uh, alongside any organizations with intellectual disabilities um, and how um, how this uh, with ADA is applied to uh, hiring someone with an intellectual disability so we do as far as employment goes so um, again looking at you know what sort of accommodations this does this person need uh, to be successful, do they need a job coach? If so, how long do they need a job coach for? And then, you know, are there, uh, you know, are there organizations out there that provide that service? Um, and and or uh, again, transportation may be an issue. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, you know, we do a lot uh, pre-employment stuff. So working on folks uh, as they get ready for employment. Um, you know, uh, how do you right now, I mean, most stuff is all online, you know, can, can an individual with an intellectual developmental disability know how to access uh, online applications and fill them out? Um, and so we work with folks to do that as well. Um, so yes, we do uh, some of those things. Um, and again, we're, you know, we're certainly happy to go into a business. You know, as we look at, you know, the holiday season, um, you know, hiring folks, uh, hopefully hiring will ramp up for all people, uh, especially people with disabilities. Um, you know, when Shane was talking, one of the things that uh, I laughed about, that when I went to training, uh, one of the things the, the trainer said that he loved Christmas time because he would go in because, you know, during Christmas time, people put up all sorts of displays and different things that restrict access. So mm -hmm. he would go through and just do this thing with his chair and just knock stuff over. Uh, just because, you know, he's like, this is not accessible. This is not, you know, I'm supposed to have this much space to get through the aisle. And so he just knocks stuff over just for fun uh, to say, hey, you're not accessible. Um, so I encourage you, if you have a business, to, to, to think about that as you, uh, you know, restrict aisle space and, and put uh, products out 
that you keep in mind that people use chairs or have mobility impairments, that you, you keep aisles. Um, I, I've been to several different Walmarts recently, and I don't know if you've noticed when you go there, they've like, their aisles now are huge right now. Uh, well, uh, in, in Washington, or Benton County anyway, uh, the ones that I've been to in, in Benton County, I haven't been here necessarily in Washington County, but um, and I don't know if that's on purpose or if that's just something that, um, you know, that they've just decided to do, but um, it, it's nice to see. I have a quick question. Um, are there any spaces that are exempt from these, and do you feel it's appropriate if they are exempt? No, sir. No, that's one of the questions we get a lot, especially like, like I said, when I went to Eureka Springs, you know, are we grandfathered in? Um, no, uh, the ADA, uh, again, 1990, so 30 some years ago. Um, but again, it gave people, uh, the ADA in 90, gave people a certain amount of time to get them up to speed. Um, but the, there is no grandfather clause with regard to ADA and there's no exemptions. But there is the consideration of undue hardship, undue hardship, and safety of people that are working there. If you're going to have to do some sort of accommodation or, or uh, change the access or something like that in such a way that it would uh, be dangerous to others, but those are, I you know, very hard to think of as far as situations yeah. like that. Now, if it fundamentally. So in Eureka Springs, there's a clause that says, you know, if it fundamentally uh, changes the facade of your building, uh, which again, a lot of times that's not what happens when you make your uh, building accessible. Um, and again, undue hardship is, you know, for instance, if you're a small business hiring five people um, and you're required to you know, put in an elevator because you, you have access now to a second floor or something. Um, you know, that could be considered an undue hardship for that business because an elevator could cost 100 grand, which you don't have. Now, likewise, undue hardship is, uh, what do I say? Um, you know, you're, so undue hardship for a Fortune 500 company here in Northwest Arkansas is gonna be hard, pretty hard to prove because you have resources. An elevator is not the same for uh, J.B. Hunt or uh, a Walmart as it is for the small business owner. Um, so th there are, yes, so I mean, if you can prove undue hardship, then you won't need to, to, to provide ac that access. But again, that's pretty hard. I mean, again, most of the accommodations are fairly inexpensive. Um, and again, if you, so a lot of times, you know, you, so if you have a two-story restaurant, um, you don't necessarily have to have an elevator um, to the second floor as long as you provide the same service on both floors. So if your concert facility is on the second floor and you don't have, it's not on the first floor, then you would be required to have an elevator because it's not same services. So if I want to go see a concert and use a chair, I can't get there. But if you have, but if you're, if you provide food and your concert venue is downstairs and you just provide food on the second floor, then you won't need an elevator because you have services provided on the first floor that everyone has access to, everybody, and so you, you won't require necessarily to have access to the second floor. I think it's also important that it, that all services are integrated. And one of the things that remind me of is like, you don't want to have back in the day when we had the, you would go to a restaurant and they would have like the smoking section and then the non-smoking section. You don't want to have the, well, yeah, we have dis disabled wheelchair access, but you have to eat in the small room in the back of the restaurant by yourself, basically. So, I mean, yeah, there's certain aspects that do need to for sure be integrated uh, as far as, um, you know, your access to that facility and the services that you can receive. Um, but I'm also reminded of two more points that that you sort of brought up, and that is access to the internet into the websites because a lot of that's where a lot of businesses start is is through the website so if i wanted to go to a restaurant well, one of the things i do is i look up their menu online so i can know what i want to order before i go so 
being able to make sure that your business website is accessible is actually pretty easy. There's a lot of online tools now that you can uh, run your uh, website through, your materials through, uh, to make sure that they're accessible and it does an accessibility check, which is good. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is that a lot of folks with disabilities, especially with visual disabilities, use our cell phones to access uh, uh, apps. Uh, there are lots of them out there, See my, Be My Eyes and Seeing AI and Ira, where you can get assistance uh, finding things with your phone. However, you need a good internet connection. So making sure that people are aware, your customers are aware that if you do have public Wi-Fi, uh, making that easy for them to get to. Uh, and to know about, I think is also very important because that can remove a lot of barriers if they have the tools, because this is one of the most powerful tools now that people have walking around uh, as far as accessibility, especially with, with low vision. Uh, so I just want to throw that in there too. Thank you so much. Questions? Um, I do have a question in regards to service dogs. How do we address allergies? To dogs like if we were go going to have a service dog on a bus yet somebody is severely allergic to having that dog in that enclosed space uh, so there's some uh, I won't say um, there's some case study uh, allergies don't count it, it it's kind of like if if you're a smoker and I'm allergic to smoke and you get on the bus I don't get kicked off because uh, I, I smoke um, so kind of the allergies are not one of those things that are, are, are a threat uh, or, or considered a threat to a person that has an allergy. Because they can remove themselves from the situation. The person with the disability can't act any other way. Correct. And I think there's also a mention of grooming the dog, that the dog has to be groomed and brushed and things like that. And that has something to do with the allergies as well. I think I was reading a one, it was talking about a, 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 it was a bakery where they prepare food. And the concern was, oh, you got all this dog hair that's going to be floating off of what, yeah. And, and basically that is, you can't exclude a service animal if it's groomed to the now what groomed means i don't i'm talking about going to the beauty shop but uh <laughs> yeah you know the word's not going to be just shedding all over the place so that's something else to consider Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and i have seen mentions of miniature horses too but i'm not sure about Th those that. are the two so miniature horses and uh, dogs are, are the two accessible animals that are actually in the legislation. So, so not, not a cat, not a peacock, not oh a- Oh no, not my bearded dragon. No, no, not considered a service <laughs> animal, no. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys so much for coming here. I really appreciate it. This was a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Wait, you didn't, you didn't I didn't